Welcome to my third video. In this video I'm going to show you a method I've been working on to make Belgian candy sugar. This sugar is used in many styles of Belgian beers and it really adds uh, some interesting characteristics. It can add some fruit flavors like plums, uh, caramel flavors, roasted flavors, chocolate flavors. So it's really a, a nice addition to a lot of beers. Uh, unfortunately it can be quite expensive and hard to find in some cases. Uh, so I've been working on a way of making it at home. So what we need for this, uh, of course, is sugar. So here I have about 300 grams, which is just under a pound of sugar. Uh, as well as some dry malt extract here, you want to use about half a tablespoon per pound or a tablespoon per kilogram uh, for this. Uh, this provides a protein source, which will be important later on. Uh, we need a good food grade um, thermometer so we can monitor the, uh, the temperature, uh, some measuring spoons. We want a large glass of ice cold water. Uh, we're going to use this to actually control the temperature of the sugar. Uh, we also want a smaller amount of, of water to, to dissolve our sugar in initially. And so believe it or not, this 100 mils of water is more than enough to dissolve this sugar. So you need about one cup of water per kilogram or one cup of water for uh, two pounds of sugar. Uh, and that's all you need. You don't want to use any more than absolutely necessary. The last thing you absolutely need is food grade lye or sodium hydroxide. Uh, or food grade lime, uh, pickling lime, not the vegetable lime, uh, which is also calcium hydroxide. And it's important that be food grade. And I would warn you at this point that this stuff is quite caustic, so you want to be careful when you're working with it. Uh, the other thing too, and I don't know if you can see it here, but often when you make this, you end up with a bit of a precipitate in the bottom. Uh, so you want to make sure you're letting that settle out and you're not putting that into your um, sugar. So that's what's required, but there are a few optional things you should include, uh, namely some sort of eye protection. We're going to be adding caustic solutions to sugar that's well above the boiling point of water, so protecting yourself is not a bad idea. A uh, second glass of water, a uh, smaller glass of water as well as a spoon is a good idea because what you can do is drop small amounts of sugar into this uh, water to cool it, recover it with your spoon and use these for taste testing as you go. Uh, now the last section here shows things that you really shouldn't have uh, with your with your sugar. So uh, first of all this is supposed to represent minerals so if you have hard water you're going to want to find some distilled water to use. Hard water will interfere with this process and can lend an unpleasant minerally flavor uh, to the finished product. Uh, you want to avoid acids like lime juice or lemon juice or cream of tartar. Uh, some other people that have published recipes have used these uh, they're common in candy making for driving sugar inversion, which is something we need to do, but they'll ruin the flavor developing step, so you really don't want to use it here. And the last thing is you probably shouldn't be drinking while you do this, and I know this runs totally counter to the normal home brewer way of doing things, but in this case you are working actually with something fairly dangerous, uh, especially those caustic solutions, so not consuming uh, too much is probably a good idea. So the first thing we want to do is heat the water to near boiling. And the next thing we want to do is mix in our dry malt extract thoroughly. If it's not thoroughly mixed into the sugar, it will tend to clump when we add it to the water. And we then want to add all of this into the water. And we're going to stir that uh, until the sugar is completely dissolved. Uh, and we don't want to heat it above boiling until we've dissolved all that sugar. Otherwise, we may burn our solution. The other thing you want to try and avoid, which I've done here, is you want to try and keep sugar from getting up on the edges of the pot. Uh, that will sort of create a coarser product if you, do, if you uh, get too much of that on the sides of the pot. So I don't know if you can see this in the video, um, but we're now ready to move to the next step. And the sign that we're ready is the solution is no longer granular. All those sugar crystals uh, have dissolved. Uh, it's a little harder to tell with the dry malt extract in here, of course, because it does cause some foaming and we will start to get some coagulation of the proteins in the dry malt extract. So that makes it a little harder to tell. But the main thing you're looking for is a lack of sugar crystals. And we're now going to heat it to the next step. Uh, as you can see here, uh, where we're starting to foam up the sugar. We're starting to drive what's called inversion reactions, uh, which is what I'll discuss next in the video. Of course, at this point, we do want to add our candy thermometer so we can regulate the temperature. So at this point, we want to raise our temperature up to 125 to 135 Celsius, or 260 to 275 Fahrenheit. Uh, and it's in this range where the sugar will begin to, to do what we call invert. What this means is the sucrose molecules, which are what table sugar is made of, 
will begin to break down into the sugars that comprise sucrose. So sucrose is made out of glucose and fructose. And so by heating it in that temperature range for about half an hour, we'll convert the sucrose into those basic sugars. This serves two purposes. Firstly, it makes the sugars easier for the yeast to ferment. Secondly, it's those sh simpler sugars that will react with the proteins in the dry malt extract uh, through what are called melodronin reactions, which are what will actually create those flavor compounds that we're looking for. So I don't know how well you can see this, but we're getting close to our top temperature. So we now want to cool down the solution back to the 125 Celsius degree range. We're, we're pushing the top of our desired temperature range. So to do this, we want to take about one tablespoon of cold water and we're going to pour it in and we're very quickly also going to stir it. Now as you can see this is that dangerous step where you can get burning sugar flying into your face so you want to be careful. The other thing you want to do is you want to give this about 10 seconds after you add the water uh, as the response of the thermometer is an instant and if it's still not quite cool enough you can add a little bit more. Uh, if it overcools don't worry about it just let it warm back up to the proper temperature and you want to keep this going for half an hour. So you want to stick in between that 125 to 135 Celsius or 260 to 275 Fahrenheit range for half an hour to complete the inversion process on the sugar. So you may recall in the intro I showed you a second glass of water. And I just want to show you exactly what it is that we're using this glass for. So here we have it. It's been chilled in the freezer so it's quite cool. So what we want to do is just grab a tiny little bit of our boiling sugar solution and we want to drop that into there basically it will have fallen down through the water and while it does so it'll cool. We can now recover that with a clean spoon and use it for a taste test uh, to see exactly how much caramelization we have uh, and to see what sort of flavor we have. So here we have obviously, um, I don't know if you can see that very well, but this is a, a non-caramelized sample from very early in the process. Later on we'll see more color developing and we'll be able to detect some of those flavors we're looking for. So at this point we've been boiling for half an hour. Uh, we've likely completed our inversion process. And so the next step now is to drive those melodroidin reactions which will create all of those wonderful flavors and colors that we want. And this is done by adding either food grade lye or food grade pickling lime uh, to the solution. And I just want to film this because it's amazing how quickly these reactions kick off when we add these. And what these are going to do actually is drive the pH up. So it's going to go from being a slightly acidic solution to being very basic. And that's where these melodroidin reactions occur and where we get all these colors. So the first thing we want to do is warm this up to about 135 Celsius or 275 Fahrenheit. Of course when we add the lye, uh, we are going to drop that temperature down. We don't want it to go down too low. Once the lye is added, we want to bring the temperature up all the way to 135 to 145 Celsius, which is 275 to 290 Fahrenheit. And those temperatures are where we're going to see a lot of these caramelization reactions occurring, a lot of these melodroidin uh, reactions occurring. And you'll see here, as soon as I add this lye, we're going to get an almost instantaneous color change. Now I'm only adding about half of what I brought. There you go, look at that already. Uh, I'm only adding about half of the lye at this point. I don't want to add all of it in one go because we might not need all of it. And this is going to create a minerally flavor if we're not careful. And as you can see, we've already, within seconds, hit a deep, dark caramel color. We, of course, want to boil this down a lot darker, a lot blacker. We're, we're looking to actually go all the way to a, an almost dark black uh, color, at which point we will have the equivalent to a, a D2 type sugar. So I wish I had uh, actually recorded this whole thing. This is only about a minute after I just left you. And look at this already. We got a dark, dark brown color. We're getting this beautiful red hue. And you can't smell it, but we've got these amazing aromas. It smells like a mixture of plums and caramel and coffee all in one. It's really great. So hopefully within just another 10 or so minutes, we'll be able to move on to the next stage, um, which is called the hard crack. Now I'd remind you at this point, I'm trying to keep the temperature at 135 to 145 Celsius, which is 275 to 290 Fahrenheit. Uh, the goal again here is to drive those melodronin reactions, which are creating all of these reds and browns, as well as a bit of caramelization in order to create um, some of those uh, caramel flavors, as well as some of the roasty flavors that we'll get uh, from actually burning a little bit of the sugar. 
So what I'm showing you here is just the, the incredible color difference uh, between just before I added the lye, which is uh, what's on the blue spatula, so that really white colored sugar, versus less than five minutes later. I mean, you can look at that uh, spoon and I mean, there's some incredible red and brown hues in there, some caramel hues on those smaller bits. And I mean, I can't, obviously you can't smell this, but the, the aroma in here is just amazing. It smells just awesome in my kitchen right now. So we're actually nearing the end. If we go over to the pot here, um, you can see that we're getting to a much darker color already, that uh, we've got quite a frothy mixture here. And the one thing I actually do want to highlight here is the temperature control here is actually a little bit more difficult than it was earlier on. Uh, it seems when you add a bit of water to this mixture that the, the uh, amount of temperature change is larger. So a teaspoon of water before would cool three to four Celsius. Um, here we're cooling much more, more like uh, six or seven degrees Celsius. I don't know why that is, um, but it's something to keep in mind that you're going to have larger temperature string uh, swings when you hit this phase. The other thing you'll notice is I'm trying to scrape the sugar back into the pot that's uh, sticking to the sides. That's to make sure that all the sugar undergoes caramelization and melodroin reactions. If you were making candy, you wouldn't want to do this because this will cause the hazier looking sugar. Uh, but in our case, we're not interested in the appearance of the sugar so much as we're interested in getting the best um, candy sugar we can out of our process. So the one other thing you need is a silicone baking pan or alternatively uh, some sort of baking pan lined with parchment paper and it has to be parchment paper not wax paper. This is what we're going to pour our finished sugar into to allow it to harden. I would recommend a silicone pan if you have it. It's so much easier to deal with than parchment paper but either works well. So I've completed my melodronin reactions. I've gotten about as much redness and as much of those fruity flavors out of this as I can. So the last step here is to now go after those roast flavors, those nutty flavors, those coffee and chocolate flavors. And the way we do this is by heating to 150 to 165 Celsius, which is 300 to 330 Fahrenheit. At these temperatures, we're going to get a lot of caramelization. So basically mild burning of the sugar. Uh, you can see this mixture is starting to get really frothy. And it's at these temperatures where we are going to develop those roast flavors. Now this is really where you want to keep a close eye on the development of this because it's you can very quickly go from nice roast flavors to burnt and unpleasant. So what you want to do is take your, your trusty glass of water, get a little bit of sugar on the end of your fork and just drip it in. And so you can see here that sunk to the bottom, it's formed a little lump. I can now dig that little lump out with my spoon, a bit of luck. Um, water could be a little bit colder because that should have solidified more. But there you can see I've got my little bit. And so now I can taste that. So that is actually almost done. Um, I know you can't taste what I'm tasting, but we have a, some nice roastiness to that. It's uh, got a very nutty flavor, almost almond-like. Uh, and it still has a lot of those fruit flavors, which are really what I, I really want to emphasize uh, in my particular brew. So it's sort of got a, a plum or date-like fruitiness to it, as well as those roasted flavors. So at this point, we're pretty much ready to finish. Now, you notice I just added a bit of water. That was just because I was a little too hot. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to make sure, before I pour this out into a pan, that I'm over um, 150 Celsius or 300 Fahrenheit and the reason for that is we I want to create what's called the hot break or sorry the hard break uh, what that is is it's a uh, uh, hot enough sugar that most of the water has been driven out so when we pour it out into the to our tray it will actually form a hard candy if you pour it out below that temperature you're going to end up with something more like nougat so it's very sticky it's very hard to work with whereas this hard break will actually give us something um, that's just like a, uh, a hard candy. It's, it's very hard. Uh, you can shatter it like glass to break into little pieces for um, throwing into your beer. Uh, so it's sort of the ideal uh, temperature range um, for casting a candy for future use. So I've now achieved my desired degree of roastiness and so I'm just going to pour this carefully into this pan. I'll use a, a silicone spatula so that I get as much of this out as I can. Uh, if you're used to making candy, you know you normally wouldn't scrape the side of the pot because you'll get a lot of uh, sugar crystals in there that are really going to sort of cloud up the product. Um, of course, we're making this for brewing purposes, so if it's less than perfect in appearance, we don't care. So I really would recommend scraping the pot well with a spatula 
to get off all of that sugar you would otherwise lose. Now, uh, what I'm going to do once I got this completely scraped out and in the pan is I'm going to let it sit for at least half an hour, if not 45 minutes. Basically, I want to be able to touch the silicone comfortably without it being too hot. At that point, we can transfer this into a deep freeze uh, in order to cool it quicker. Uh, if you do that, it'll be ready in about an hour. Uh, if you're not in a rush, you can let this sit for five to six hours on the counter to let it cool to the point where, it's ha where you can handle it and begin to use it. So the last thing I'd like to show you are these three different candy sugars that I've prepared. Uh, this first one was produced using a method you'll see on a lot of uh, blogs and on uh, some, uh, some of the brewing sites. Uh, this is produced using the classical candy maker's method of adding something like cream of tartar or something along the lines of lime juice or lemon juice to acidify the mix. So this increases the rate of that inversion process, but it inhibits those uh, melodronin uh, melodronin and caramelization reactions and so this is actually a two hour cook and you can see that I have almost no color. So this would be really good to add to uh, an English style ale as an invert sugar but it's not going to add much character. Uh, for anyone who reads my blog this is the candy I produced in my first blog post on making Belgian candies. You can see it's got sort of a medium brown color this one I didn't cook at that higher temperature, that 150 to 165 Celsius or 300 to 330 Fahrenheit range for very long. So it lacks a lot of the caramelization flavors but it really has some nice fruity notes to it. So if you're aiming for the fruit end of the, the spectrum, this is something good to aim for. Basically you, you cook at that 135 to 145 Celsius, 275 to 290 Fahrenheit range for 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, don't let it get above that until you go for that hard crack and you'll make something nice like this. On the right we have uh, today's product. Now I kind of broke it because I was rushing and uh, it's not really cooled all the way yet. You can see it's much darker in color than either of the two products. And the major difference between it and my, my uh, first blog post sugar is it's got a lot of the roasty notes on top of those nice fruity notes. So it really still has those plum flavors but on top of that it's got these beautiful caramel coffee and almost chocolate like flavors. Uh, so tomorrow I'm brewing a beer. These two are going into it. Uh, in a few weeks I'm actually going to brew an English style beer uh, with this one going into it. So I'm going to see here uh, hopefully in a couple of months how these three different sugars work actually in a beer. But again pointing out this is not candy sugar. This is not the way to make it. Uh, this method um, shown on the two on the right uh, can be used to produce different qualities and different characters within the candy sugar depending on how long you hold at these different temperatures uh, and really you know how hot you push your sugar mixture. So that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, if you follow my blog you'll see the results of these beers uh, posted there eventually.